the big journey that I finally got to have that was visionary was the spirit of ayahuasca visiting me and asking me, do you want to create life? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> Psychedelics are said to shift our fixed perspectives, giving us a bird's eye view of our own lives and helping to remove the lenses of cultural, religious, and social conditioning through which we are taught to see the world. They are being used therapeutically and somatically to treat depression, addiction, PTSD, and trauma. And many are using them to explore the ineffable, those unknown realms of consciousness and beyond. Join us in Adventures of the Psyche as we learn how psychedelics have transformed people's lives. Welcome to Adventures of the Psyche. Today we are joined by me, Marisa Sturtz. We learned after six grueling and anticlimactic ayahuasca journeys that trauma is also stored in the body and blocks life from happening. And sometimes the only way to unlock it is by following your gut and bucking the system. I grew up with somewhat of a, perhaps an unusual childhood. I was raised in Las Vegas, the child of immigrants. Um, my baby brother died when I was three years old of sudden infant death syndrome. And my parents, as a result, got into born-again Christianity, which teaches us we are all sinners and we're all going to hell unless you've accepted Jesus Christ into your heart as your only personal savior. Um, my parents were amazing in so many ways and they did such a good job in so many ways and at the same time they didn't have the tools to deal with the stresses of leaving, losing a child and of um, life <laughs> and there was a lot of anger. I became a really shy, anxious kid with very low self-esteem and uh, it got so bad, I, would, I was getting picked on. I would try to share sentences and talk to people. And halfway through, I would just stop believing what I had to say was of any interest and drift off. Uh, I ended up spending one whole year hiding in the bathroom because I had no friends during lunchtime and I didn't want to be seen. And I so desperately wanted to have friends. And so it, it really it was, it was a bit rough. I started questioning religion. <laughs> Um, I started questioning everything, uh, the religion I wasn't connecting to, and pastors were like, have faith, and I'm like, but it doesn't make sense to me, and, you know, I'd start questioning my parents, and, and a lot, I, the answer was always like, that's just how it is, you just deal with it, like, things aren't always fair, things don't always make sense, that's just how it is, because I said so, chin up, make it work, and so I did, I did my best, you know, I made my way through high school with the mantra of just play cool, don't care, it's going to be okay. I eventually started finding little self-help books and things, trying to fix my anxiety, but also I, I very much felt the need to work very hard to prove my worth. And so I kind of became a bit of a workaholic using alcohol and sugar and caffeine to sort of manage my anxiety and my inability to immerse in the moment because that voice in the back of my head was so hypercritical and analyzing and felt so separate. Um, so, so alcohol did indeed become a good friend of mine. And uh, I made my way through college studying film in San Francisco and um, things just, you know, I, I've always had this big urge to be really creative but unless there was some actual product at the end of it, I never allowed myself to go into it. And so I really, um, I struggled a lot to, to thrive. I, my relationships reflected it. My creative or work, my films, they never really took off. Uh, I would kill myself to do them. I would put everything on my credit card. I would be like so dedicated. I'm going to make it work and it's going to really matter. And um, everything kind of, a few of them actually made it somewhere interesting, but not really. <clears throat> and as I said, I was reading little books here and there, but I didn't have the time because I was too busy struggling to make ends meet to ever really dedicate a lot of energy into healing this or following this gut feeling that there was something wrong with me. You know, later on, I, I, I found ayahuasca. I, I worked with it four times 
over the course of uh, five years or so. And every time it would make me super nauseous and sick and feel terrible. And, and it would make my thoughts dull. There was no visuals or no insight, no anything. Uh, and I was so frustrated because finally this thing came around that was like, oh, this is going to help you heal. But it didn't really work for me. Except that it did start eventually making a dent, maybe. Or perhaps my own personal growth did. And I, I started to get a little bit better with making films. I started getting into documentaries. I eventually got hired for this really cool gig in Panama that was a little bit um, out of my skill level, but I, I kind of made it work. Um, but I had ran myself into the ground by the time I started that job. I was exhausted from overworking and the caffeine and the sugar and the alcohol. And I got out there and it was a really intense shoot of 13 to 15 hour days that I couldn't keep up on. Uh, and I knew I, my skills weren't quite on par and I had so much anxiety that just ate away at me and ran me down into the ground. I became pretty depressed and halfway through I was like, okay, I'm, this is super unhealthy for me. I need to leave. And so I gave my notice and I left and I was in Central America at the time in Panama going, okay, what, what now? And ayahuasca kept popping up in the back of my head. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I followed this gut feeling and I... I went to Peru, into the Amazon, into Iquitos, uh, and met a bunch of travelers who had been working with some shamans out there, uh, different ones. And we were all at a hostel, and we became good friends, and traveled around and visited each other's shamans. Uh, and I found two that really impressed me. They, they both actually diagnosed me with this condition because I came to them going, ayahuasca doesn't work for me. Is it possible that this is the definition of crazy, trying the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results? Um, I don't know why, but I still feel like I, I should be working with this medicine. Is it possible it doesn't work? And they're like, no, well, we're going to figure out a way. And so it worked with me. And then after ceremony or, or at the end of ceremony, they said, okay, both of these different shamans, a hundred miles apart from each other, said, you have a condition called pulsario, a pocket of negative air and energy, the result of undigested traumas. And so I, I, I followed their advice and I did a couple of dietas with each of them um, where, where you live in isolation in the jungle and, and drink plant medicines, eat a very plain diet, pursue all these ways of really allowing yourself to connect and clean your system. And at the end of uh, my time in Peru, I finally broke through. I had a couple of really, really impressive experiences. Uh, and I was finally also illuminated to why the ayahuasca hadn't been working or hadn't been working. I, I started to understand ayahuasca doesn't always work the way you think it should. In my case, this pulsario condition, this pocket of negative air and energy that was like blocking the ayahuasca from getting up here, I believe was very much the trauma that I experienced that was stored in my body on a physical cellular level. So much of my life force had been spent in contraction in like a protective mode from this world that I had interpreted as constantly attacking me, um, where I was on such a hypervigilant state of being overprotective of myself because I was so conditioned to, to be defensive. And that, that energy was in my cells and was so dense that the ayahuasca not working up here, but like a chisel working deep in my gut, loosening whatever and however this works in our bodies. Um, and over time and with dedication and the help of these shamans, I was able to clear it out and eventually have a connection. And the big journey that I finally got to have that was visionary was the spirit of ayahuasca visiting me and asking me, do you want to create life? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and first I like peeked my eyes open, looked around. I was like, okay, there's no dudes around. This is not some weird ploy. <laughs> because for a moment I was like, are we, are we talking like a baby? And then I was like, okay, well maybe, she, maybe 
ayahuasca means immaculate conception. I don't know. And, and the experience was so lovely and so beautiful. And I felt that if I said no, it would stop. And I also thought, okay, at this point, I know this medicine is teaching me so much. I had already been able to understand a lot about how that trauma was held in my body physically and that how this process was shifting it out. And so with this big question of, are you willing to create life? I was really like in that altered state, like, well, maybe, maybe I'm going to have immaculate conception and have a baby with ayahuasca. Let's see. I don't know. That would be kind of extraordinary. So I said, yes, I did not have a baby, but I did finally <laughs> address a thing that had been plaguing me my whole life. This inability to create with any level of success the life that ended up happening when I, roughly I was like did the math and I was like this is like nine months from my ayahuasca journey that um I'd been wanting to create video content around psychedelics everyone had told me it was impossible but around nine months after that journey I uh, finally had the funding and was starting to shoot these episodes starting to create this baby that I I feel that I've is one of the missions in my life and so what I've come to learn is that's not just how it is oftentimes we think okay chin up and yeah bad things happened it's in the past move on uh, what I've come to learn is that thing that happened in the past can often block you in your life in my case it blocked me very much from ever thriving the things that happened in my past had me stuck believing the limiting beliefs of I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me. And those beliefs were so strong and so powerful that they literally blocked every aspect of my life that I cared to thrive in. And it wasn't until I was able, that until I put the dedicated energy into unpacking that, which those ayahuasca experiences were just the beginning of it, but me following that gut feeling that there was something left to learn and the process of going to the jungle and throwing myself out of my comfort zone and really exploring my own healing process has been one of the most incredible things I've ever done for myself. It has allowed me to fulfill some of my wildest dreams that I thought I was never p p capable of doing. Um, and now I'm, I'm so grateful. There's so much creativity and flow and I'm able to make music and thrive and draw and paint and um, be in front of people and talk with so much confidence and so much joy. And it's because I didn't just make it work, uh, but because I trusted the gut feeling to unpack it. And so this has also helped inform my life's work of really how do we celebrate the healing journey? Because, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, there's things that happen that we're not proud of and we're not excited about in our childhood and we don't want to talk about. But when you allow yourself to go into the darkness, to uncover those layers, what can shine through is your most, most authentic, magical self. And, and when you are clear and open and available for that, life becomes so extraordinary. And so normally I would um, ask the guest questions, and since I'm both the host and the guest, um, I'll, I'll let you guys ask me any virtually if you have any questions. Sending so much love. Thanks for watching.